So the first question is, um, what do we mean by prehistory in a British context? And why is it a contentious term among some archaeologists? Yeah, well, prehistory, of course, literally means before history. Now, people used to mean by history, uh, the study of the past from documentary records. Now, documentary records means that a society can write. Now, of course, uh, writing appeared in Britain first with the arrival of the Romans. So you could say that Roman Britain is the start of history. Before that, we're back into the Iron Age and uh, they're therefore in prehistory. Now, uh, there was no such term as prehistory in English until about the middle of the 19th century. And that, that's when the term was first used. And then in 1867, a great Victorian called Sir John Lubbock, who also invented bank holidays, uh, he wrote a book called Prehistoric Times. And this was something of a bestseller. And it, that, if you like, popularized the term pre, prehistory. Uh, this was a time, of course, when people are becoming aware of the discoveries of geology, uh, Darwin's origin of species, and so on. And so uh, people start to realize that the old biblical idea that the Earth began in 4004 BC is probably not true, that the Earth was much older. However, in the 19th century, people had very, very little idea about the real age of uh, mankind or of the Earth. Now, today, of course, by prehistory, we, we mean before the written records, but that in Britain might go back to the first century AD. But of course, if you're in Australia, it would be the arrival of Captain Cook. Or, so in different parts of the world, prehistory goes on to different periods. Um, but now with, uh, in prehistory, we're of course developed much more sophisticated techniques of forensic archeology, span the study of environments and so on. And so some people think, say, well, perhaps we shouldn't talk about prehistory anymore. Perhaps it's all history. We're much better at dating the past now. So if we can be precise about the dating of the past, then uh, perhaps we should just regard it all as history. But when we go back into the deep past, into deep time, then we're overlapping with geology, with paleontology, and uh, and also with anthropology, the origins of human beings. So prehistory, perhaps we could push back to uh, say uh, three, four million years ago. Okay, so that's set the scene. That's give us an understanding of, of what we're talking about. Now, um, the first question from, from one of our uh, audiences from Emily Nelson on Twitter, who asked the question, how do we talk about the fact that everything we know when it comes to prehistory, we don't actually know? She goes on to say it's more of an educated, educated guess. So basically, she's, she's sort of inquiring about the process of understanding prehistory. Mm -hmm. how, how do we actually know what we're talking yes. about here? The, 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 unfortunately, there's quite a lot of fantasy archaeology, you know, where people sort of have opinions and, uh, and voice their opinions as if they are facts or the truth without actually having any real evidence. It's the sort of idea of little green men from Mars in uh, 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 building Stonehenge, that type of attitude. There's a lot of that kind of publication, but actually real archeology, span real prehistory is, uh, the, is the very careful gathering of data. And then on the basis of that data, uh, trying to put together uh, the uh, theories uh, about the past. And those should, can be tested. The more data we gather, the more we can test it. Now, there is, I, I, what I would argue with that question is that this idea that we kind of invent it or kind of uh, just um, make a wild guess. There are many things that are absolutely clear facts. Let me just give you an example. We now know that the earliest hominins, that's the ancestors of human beings, have been observed in Britain in about a million years ago. But about 600,000 years ago, at a place called Boxgrove, which is in Sussex, uh, we actually found a place where an, a hominin, probably Homo heidelbergensis, that's a predecessor of Neanderthals, this person sat there on the ground and made a flint tool, leaving the chippings of the flint tool, the flint chippings all around where the person was sitting. And they made a cutting tool. Nearby, 
they joined up with a, with a gang of their mates and they butchered a rhinoceros. They were surrounded, in fact, by a plain, which was probably looked rather like Africa because it had lions and hyenas and, and, and such like. Now, that's not me guessing, those are facts. We, and that tells us a lot about the early history of the human colonization of, of Britain. What I can't tell you though, is exactly how these people communicated with each other. What form of language, if language they had. They were obviously quite intelligent. They were large, large they were well-built, very athletic. Uh, capable of making sophisticated tools, but we don't know anything about their language or much about their social organization. Uh, that we need more data for. Okay, so Boxgrove, the, uh, the site you talked about there, that would be uh, in the uh, um, archaeological terminology, that would be in the lower Paleolithic. That's the lower um, Paleolithic, yeah. And then we move on to the middle Paleolithic and the upper Paleolithic and then the Mesolithic. Um, uh, all <laughs> no, those people, yeah. and we no, may, yeah. we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll come I, on. I should, just, I should say, when in the 19th century people were trying to sort out all this stuff, it, the Danish archaeologists, well particularly the Danish museum curators, had cases full of stuff and no idea how to date it, so they invented the three age system. Stone, bronze, iron. That doesn't work all over the world, but it works in Western Europe. Now, the, so we had a three age system. When Lubbock wrote his book in 1865, he divided the Stone Age into the Old Stone Age and the New Stone Age or the Neolithic, which is now sort of synonymous with agriculture. Uh, but as you just said, the Old Stone Age has got divided up even more. Okay. So we so the next question we're kind of we're going to skip over all of that 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 Paleolithic period yeah, really past a few million years yeah we're just going to avoid that bit um, because the next question moves us right on into into the uh, the, the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition um, if we want to talk about those characterizations and perhaps we don't but the question is why did people move from hunting and gathering to farming and when did the change happen and then there's mm. a follow up is what impact did it make on the landscape. Mm. Well, certainly for two or three million years, hominins, the ancestors of humans, and then Homo sapiens uh, lived by hunting and gathering. That's what we did for the vast majority of our time on Earth. And then over the, about the last 12,000 years, in about, around about 10,000 BC or so, uh, the uh, things began to change. Now, we uh, there was what archaeologists refer to as the Neolithic Revolution, although again some archaeologists don't like that term either, because uh, revolution perhaps it's more of a process than a rapid event. But however, I think it's quite a good term because it was a revolution in the way humans lived, and it wasn't invented in one place. The Neolithic Revolution or the move towards farming happens in about ten or a dozen places around the world, all at quite similar times from the Americas through Central Asia or, or Western Asia, uh, into China and into New Guinea. We get this move towards domestication of plants and animals. And it seems to come about because uh, people become, especially in the Near East where we can perhaps see it, archeologists have studied it most carefully. In the Near East, we get sites like Ohalu, which is on the uh, Lake, Lake Galilee in Israel. And there we can see that well before the Neolithic, people had an incredibly sophisticated knowledge of plants and animals. And they were not farming exactly, but they were managing plants. They realized that you could bring them together and grow them in sort of plots and so on. And the plants were still wild, uh, wild cereals, for example, like einkorn, from which you could make bread. But it allowed these people to settle down and live in one place. Now, they were, looked like they were well on the move towards farming. But then, of course, the climate changed and we got what was called the, the, the Younger Dryas. It was a very cold spell that went on for a few centuries. And it really knocked back this move towards farming. But once the climate changed again with the end of the last glaciation, uh, somewhere, say, let's say for the sake of argument, about 10,000 BC, uh, the, um, then uh, the people all around the world seem to move towards this more managed approach to uh, to uh, plants and animals, which allows them 
to settle down more and to produce more food. And then gradually over a period, these plants become domesticated. So they actually change. In many cases, their seeds become much bigger. In some cases, the plants become domesticated in such a way that they then rely on human beings to look after them and, in, in, and actually plant them and tend them. Same with animals, the sheep, for example, a wild animal in the Near East, but once domesticated, becomes easier to manage. Same with cattle and, uh, and, and, and wild pigs. So the farming begins in the Near East, as far as we're concerned, and then over the course of several thousand years, farmers spread westwards. Well, they spread eastwards too, but for us, they're spreading westward. The reason they spread is because farming uh, allows you to produce more food and have more children. Hunter-gatherers tend to have few children, and uh, the, the farmers had more. They wanted the labor. They also had the means to feed the children, and so their population grows and they begin to spread and they push westwards. And then eventually from say 10,000 to 4,000 BC, farming arrives in Britain. There was another bit to the question, wasn't there? There was, yeah. So um, there was a question about how it changed the landscape. Yeah, well, of course the landscape was changing anyway at, at this time, because we're talking about the end of the last uh, glacial interlude when Britain was uh, would be a tundra. At its most extreme nobody lived here, nobody lived in Britain but as it warmed up slightly people did move into Britain and, uh, the, la and the tundra landscape which would have been a landscape with mammoth and reindeer and so on that changes and we start to get a, a, a wooded landscape in what is generally called the Mesolithic or the Middle Stone Age. And that's when Britain uh, is, uh, is, uh, is becoming forested. It used to be thought that the forest was a kind of solid canopy. It probably wasn't. We had big animals like auroch. Auroch are a great big uh, uh, form of cattle. And they probably created clearings in it so that the, the forest wasn't solid. It would have been open parkland in places. The other thing you've got to remember is we were losing a huge amount of land because there was all that land known as Doggerland, which is now under the North Sea. What had been land between Britain and Scandinavia was flooded as the ice melted, sea level rose, and by 6,500, Britain becomes an island. So if you want farming, though now the sheep have to be brought over the sea. Uh, now, now look, so we've got the next question is from uh, Kusjak on Twitter and uh, uh, this person obviously has studied archaeology because the, the question is, is quite specific. Uh, the Neolithic Revolution, diffusion or displacement? What's the latest evidence? So you're going yeah. to have to, you're going to have to talk Explain us through. Explain what that means. Yeah, that's because ever, ever, since, ever since I was a student back in the 60s, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fashion in archaeology was for the idea First of all, uh, it became very unfashionable to believe in invasion hypotheses, the idea that change took place because of invasions. Instead, archaeologists began to say, no, the Mesolithic people themselves adopted farming. They learned how to farm. It didn't need a lot of foreigners to come in and teach them. They could do it for themselves. Uh, on the other hand, recently, the pendulum has swung the other way. So for example, uh, a few years ago, I was involved in the excavation of a site in Kent. It was on the line of the, uh, the uh, high-speed link when they put the railway in. And as, it, as the high-speed link came close to the downs, we moved vast quantities of earth that had slid down the slope of the downs. And underneath that blanket of earth, we found the earliest Neolithic settlement in Britain dated to somewhere after, just after 4,100 BC. And there, there was an enormous big timber house. There was, uh, there was evidence of uh, cereals, evidence of domesticated animals, a whole package that was totally unlike anything in the Mesolithic. Also, it had flint tools and it had ceramics pots. Now, actually, the archeology span archaeological evidence suggests that that looked like a group of people probably coming from the continent. 
However, that was not the fashionable idea. But what we're now finding, particularly from uh, the very large number of DNA studies that are taking place, is that farming probably was brought by newcomers coming over from the continent, bringing with them all the paraphernalia of farming, including new buildings, and, uh, and then establishing colonies in, first of all, say we found the one in Kent in the Medway. Uh, there's two schools of thought, I should say here. One is that there may have been a major gateway through Kent into, into Britain, or there may have been several different gateways, some further west. However, the, the evidence now is moving towards the idea that farming was brought by new settlers coming from the continent. And those people had been farming for several hundred years, actually, just across the channel. And they probably came at this time, I think, partly because there were changes in climate that pushed them to come. And also because, personally, I think that the population of Mesolithic Britain was very low, probably only a few thousand people. In other words, there was a new farming frontier going begging, and they came. That's a fascinating thought to, to imagine such a low population density. Um, now look, so we've got an, the next question is from Tom Evans on Twitter, uh, and uh, he's asking, how did change in diet affect the prehistoric populations in Britain? And he's specifically asking about the change in diet between the hunter-gatherer diet uh, that mm. you just talked about and yeah. the, the, the early farmer's diet. So yeah. you got anything on that? Well, there's been quite a lot published, uh, especially in America in recent years, implying that once we went over to farming, the diet became rather poor and unhealthy. Although it provides more calories, more energy, if you like, per acre, it results in a rather monotonous and boring diet. And in some cases, it's also been suggested that along with that, you've got new diseases, rather like we're suffering from now, new diseases that were caught from animals, domestic animals. So a lot of people have sort of said, oh, the Neolithic was a really bad thing. The diet was to be bloody awful. Everybody had to live on porridge. In contrast, the Neolithic diet actually sounds quite interesting. You've got, uh, you, you've got nuts and berries and salmon and uh, wild deer and so on and so forth. Uh, but the point was, is that the, ne the Neolithic diet, the farming diet, was, if you like, more reliable. You could live in one place and you could get more out of the ground in terms of calories that allowed for a bigger settled population. And to, have, and to have more children. One of the things that's very striking at, uh, at this time, and we know this from, uh, uh, from studies of teeth, is that the farmers, the farming spread across Britain very quickly. In probably about two to 300 years, it spread from, let's say, Kent, right across into Ireland, into Northern Scotland. But right across Britain, there seems to have been a taboo on eating uh, uh, the products of the sea. So no, nobody's eating fish. Even people who are living close to the sea are still not eating fish, which seems rather odd. Uh, that's at the beginning, early on in the, in the Neolithic. So that affects the diet. And uh, the undergatherer way of life disappears very rapidly. So, uh, so, so the, the diet does change. I don't think you'd have necessarily enjoyed the farmer's diet more, but it allowed you to build up your population. We're going, to, we're going to charge on. So we've got two questions here uh, that, that came in from uh, Fior Hallabjorg uh, and Rory O'Connell, both on Twitter. And they ask questions about uh, the stone tool trade. Um, yeah. Obviously, the stone tools were widely used in, in the Neolithic and indeed in, in the Mesolithic. So the question they're asking is, were stone tools traded and basically how far did they go? Um, yeah, yes, they were. I mean, one of the things that characterizes Homo sapiens is our... Uh, willingness and our ability to trade. It's one of the big differences between us and Neanderthals. We seem to have had much wider networks very uh, early on. Uh, so at this period, we find that the types of tools change for farming. Particularly, uh, the Neolithic is characterized by the polished stone axe. And the interesting thing is, is that in the Mesolithic of Ireland, they had polished stone axes before we had them in Britain. It, Ireland seems to have been quite cut off in the Mesolithic. It seems to have been quite an isolated community, but they do seem to have had this technological breakthrough of, of producing very early polished stone axes. 
However, in most of Britain, poly, the polished stone axe appears in, uh, in, in, with the farmers. Now, at that time, they're also making axes out of flint. They want axes, the farmers want axes because they want to chop trees down. In order to create farmland, you need to get rid of those trees. You probably do it by chopping them and burning them. They, that the, a lot of the flint, of course, comes out of the chalk. And we have flint mines, places like Grimes Graves and on the Sussex Downs, and very sophisticated where they're burrowing down into the ground, uh, finding the seams of flint in the chalk, and then following those seams, rather like mining coal, uh, and, uh, and it's done on a big scale. But those flint tools don't need to go all that far because there's a lot of flint around, in, particularly in southern and central England, not so much in Scotland. But on the other hand, these early farmers seem to have absolutely delighted in exotic stone. And they absolutely loved green stones. And we know that some of those traveled hundreds of miles. So for example, there's a very spectacular mountain in the Alps called Monteviso, which is on the border between France and uh, Italy. And there's been a fantastic research project there by a couple called the Petrokons. And they've found the sources of these green stone axes. And, they, and it's made out of a material called jadeite, not jadeite, jadeite. And, but it's very beautiful stuff. And they found exactly where this, this stuff was being mined. And it then traveled north. A lot of it came into Brittany in the fifth millennium BC, and then into Britain as well, very early on uh, in the Neolithic. But then the, the British farmers must have started prospecting for green stones themselves, because they found a number of sites in Britain, particularly uh, Langdale in the Lake District, excuse me, in the Lake District, and also a couple of uh, mining sites in Northern Ireland, in County Antrim in the Northeast, where these kinds of uh, uh, spectacular stones could be found to make these axes, which were probably not primarily of practical use, who probably had a, a very high status or sacred function. And they began to trade those uh, Langdale axes and the Northern Irish axes uh, all over the British Isles. They, they, tra they travel all over the place. But that's because they are regarded as uh, special objects. Okay, now this is a, a question that's uh, quite difficult to answer. Uh, it's from Lady Carrie on Twitter, and I don't imagine you've, you've done this, but uh, have you ever counted how many stone circles there are in Britain? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and then following on from that, why, why did they build them? Uh, no, I haven't. I read a book last week uh, a new book that just came out on the stone circles of Wales. And there are 70 odd stone circles in Wales. But actually in Britain, uh, I don't think anybody has produced a definitive number. And that's because there's a big problem with stone circles, which is you can't always recognize them because quite often stones get removed and you might end up with one stone or two or three stones. And so there's a, lot of, there's a problem of definition in other words. However, there are many hundreds, let's say that. Now, a man called Aubrey Burl wrote a book on the, the uh, stone circles of Britain, and he did a distribution map. He didn't quantify them exactly, but he did a distribution map, and the stone circles are found where there is good hard stone. So mainly in the west of the country, from Cornwall and Devon, uh, through Wales, where I say there are 70 odd now recorded, uh, up into the, the Pennines, the Lake District, and then right up into northeastern Scotland. And then also a very large number of them in southwest Ireland and northeast Ireland. Okay, so let's just say a few hundred. But of course, you've also got to remember that they're part of a megalithic tradition in which there were many other types of stone monuments, avenues, standing stones, uh, stone tombs, and so on. But the circles themselves are particularly difficult for archaeologists because on the relatively few that have been excavated, um, many of them have already been damaged by, by farming and, uh, and people pinching the stones. When you do excavate within them, you don't find much. <laughs> uh, so there's not a lot of clues as to what was going on. So you often have to judge them by the landscape that they're in. And quite often these circles seem to be in circular landscapes. And it's almost as if the circle itself is reflecting the cosmos. 
the, the circle of the sky, the circle of the land. And quite often they're placed in positions where people would probably have come from scattered communities in order to gather for some kinds of festivals, from which we can really only speculate. And this is where prehistory can get a bit vague, uh, because although we can measure the stone circles and so on, we can tell what kind of stone they're made of, we can't always detect the precise activities that were happening there. Sometimes there are burials, sometimes they seem to be feasts, but generally speaking, there's very, very little evidence uh, within the circles themselves. Sorry about that. That's okay. Now, the next question is no doubt um, uh, linked to, to one we've just talked about, which is, why did they use barrows? Now, barrows, mm. you know, archaeologists have struggled to categorize barrows in many different ways, your long barrows, no, your round barrows. That that, I don't think it means the things we pick up and move earth with, does it? And that's but, not what we're talking not about. Not a wheelbarrow, no. We're, talk, we're talking about these large mounds of yeah. earth which come in different yeah. shapes and sizes and which, yeah. which date to the Neolithic Bronze Age as well. Yeah, the, word, the word barrow comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, biog, which means a mound. And of course, uh, normally speaking, uh, there are burial mounds. Because uh, back in the Neolithic, these early farmers made burial mounds that were long. And quite often they, were, they had stone chambers in them and, and elaborate stone entrances and so on. There are many different types. Uh, places like West Kennet, near Avebury, for example, uh, or Wayland Smithy, where I, I worked uh, recently. These, uh, these have got chambers in them which when excavated, if they're, if they're well preserved, Hazelton, for example, on the Cotswolds, was a very well preserved barrow, which Alan Savile, a friend of mine, excavated some years ago. And there, the burials were intact. Now, they were not intact skeletons. They were ossuaries, where lots and lots of bones had been collected and placed in the chambers. And uh, it seems that these long barrows, and we're talking about 3000 BC or so, these long barrows were kind of communal burials. They don't seem to have had everyone in them. It was perhaps people from important families or whatever, but when men, women, and children, and very few grave goods. That's the Neolithic ones, the long, the long barrows, if you like. When we get into the Bronze Age, round about uh, middle or third millennium BC, there we get the individual barrows, like you see around Stonehenge. And those tend to often have individual burials and can be very high status burials. People can be buried with, uh, with weapons, with gold, with pots and so on. And, and it looks as if there's been a change in society. In the Neolithic, it was a communal burial ground for the ancestors that probably marked your ownership of land. It's a way of saying, this is where we live, this is our land, the land of our ancestors. In the Bronze Age, it's more a way of saying, this is an important person. This is a chieftain or a warrior or an important woman who has been buried here with elaborate grave goods, in a, often in a very prominent position. So very different things socially, I think. Now, we just mentioned the, the Bronze Age there uh, a couple of times, which links to the next question, uh, which is from uh, Fraglast on Twitter, uh, who asks, why don't we ever discuss a British Chalcolithic, uh, which is oh. the, the Copper Age. So you, you in yes. some parts of the world, you go Neolithic, Copper Age, Bronze Age. We don't. We that's don't right. That that's there, a uh, that's a bit of a technical question as well. I imagine most people have never heard of the Chalcolithic, but uh, but but yes, as you say, it's the Copper Age, which comes before the Bronze Age. And the reason for that is that when uh, people begin to discover the use of metals in the Near East, for example, met, uh, they they first they first of all realised that metals like copper and, and uh, gold uh, can be uh, obtained relatively easily. Now, it's not that easy, actually. There's some quite clever, te uh, clever technical things that have to be learned. But, but, but copper is much easier than bronze. But bronze is much harder, I mean, as a material. In other words, if you want a really effective weapon, it's better to have a bronze weapon than a rather soft copper weapon. They, but to make bronze, you have to add 10% tin, and tin's quite rare. Now, the, question, the thing is, is that we do get copper tools in the middle of the third millennium BC. By about 2150 BC, we're getting bronze tools. 
bronze is uh, Britain is important in terms of bronze because Britain is one of the big sources of tin, Cornwall particularly. But uh, and so we know that people were coming to Britain for tin. The Nebra disc, for example, this fantastic disc with astronomical symbols on it that was found in Germany. When that was analysed, it was found that the tin came from Cornwall. So the tin, uh, so tin makes bronze. But for a couple of hundred years or more, people were in Britain making copper, uh, uh, copper objects. So should we call that the Calcolithic? Well, actually, uh, we don't usually, but there has recently been quite a lot of debate about it in archaeological circles. And there's been a, an enormous book full of erudite papers, some arguing that we should start using the term Calcolithic. Just out of interest, I've got a copy of this book in England, but just out of interest, I looked online yesterday to see if it was still available. It's out of print and the cheapest copy I could find was 440 pounds. So if that's anything to go by, I think we're not gonna get a Calcolithic. Uh, but, uh, but I personally would be in favor of not adopting the term because I think we've got enough jargon terms in archeology. span And I'm one of those who believes in using dates rather than, uh, than, uh, than jargon. So I wouldn't want to complicate the position even more by talking about a calcolithic. However, I just, one final comment, sorry. It is, it is, I think one of the things that people don't realize is that at this time, there was actually the first industrial revolution in Britain, and particularly in North Wales, where archeologists in recent years have found massive copper mines. And uh, on a really huge scale, near Llandudno and on Anglesey, and also in Cheshire. Uh, and it does look as if uh, there really was a huge industry going on at that time, producing copper on a, for a, on a European scale. And we, I think we, most people are unaware of that. Okay. Um, right, one of the next um, sort of class classes of, of, uh, of, of landscape feature that appears in prehistory is the hill fort. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, we've got a, a very popular question on Google um, is what were people actually doing in uh, Iron Age hill forts is, is quite specific Iron Age hill forts now you may you may question whether they were uh, used in the Iron Age or, or started more in the Bronze Age but again we're getting into, into yeah, archaeological yeah, yeah. semantics but, um, <laughs> but what's, 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 what's well, the well, point well, of hill forts? Well I, I was recently involved in a project uh, at, at Whitehorse Hill in uh, Oxfordshire where we excavated the hill fort uh, known as Uffington Castle. But uh, some of my colleagues also excavated other hill forts along the Ridgeway. And actually, the first thing you should say is that um, the earliest of these hill forts seemed to appear in the late Bronze Age, around, um, around about the 8th century BC, that sort of date. Uh, and uh, the, although we call them hill forts, because they're usually on hills and because they've got big ramparts, it would be wrong to think of them really as military forts. That's not what they're about. In fact, the problem is that they seem to have actually fulfilled quite a few different functions. Now, actually, although they're incredibly prominent and impressive structures in the English landscape, um, very few of them have actually been excavated on any scale. So, uh, we, so we don't know. We don't know. We haven't got that much data about them, but. What we do find is that some of them, like Whitehorse, the Uffington Castle site, had very little evidence that people lived in it much at all. It looked like it was a place probably for ceremonial gatherings. However, it was still built to look very impressive. On the other hand, another smaller hill fort called Alfred's Castle, that seemed to have an extended family living in it. It was smaller and it was basically a fortified farm. And you, you find this, that, in, uh, that the evidence suggests that hill forts are used for different things. Uh, the most famous one probably, uh, or at least the most excavated one is uh, Barry Cunliffe's excavation at, uh, uh, at Danbury. And he excavated half of the hill fort. And at its peak, that had a large number of houses and storage facilities in it. It was like a kind of large village with lots of people living there. But that's relatively un unusual. So I'm afraid uh, at the moment, uh, hill forts seem to be something that uh, can have a lot of different functions. They always seem to be a long way from water though. So uh, 
<laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to have the job of bringing the water to the hill fort. No, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Yeah, if they, if they were for, for defence and uh, uh, people staying in for a long time, then uh, you need water. Now, look, you just, you just talked about uh, Uffington. Um, yeah. And uh, that leads into quite a specific question, which which you've been looking at um, in your in your most recent book, which is why did people carve white horses into the chalk downlands during this period? And of course, near the hill fort you just talked about, there is the famous white horse. Yeah, and and that was one of the reasons that we did the project there with the National Trust, because there, of course, been lots and lots of speculation about the white horse at Uffington. That's the one. That is a rather abstract shape. It looks like it's flowing across the hill in segments and it looks like it's got a rather beaked head and um, it's, a, it's a very impressive piece of design I think and we know it's old because there are Anglo-Saxon charters a thousand years old that record it being there a thousand years ago but people have speculated as to how old and anyway we decided to take a look at it and at the time in Ox when I was based in Oxford we, the uh, laboratory in Oxford was just developing a new dating technique called optical stimulated luminescence. And that meant that we could potentially date silt buried in the ground rather than needing, you know, a piece of my arm or a, a lump of wood or something organic, which is what you need for radiocarbon dating. So we thought in principle, this OSL dating might help us date the horse. So when we excavated the horse at Uffington, uh, we, ended, we discovered that it actually was, was built at the end of the Bronze Age or the beginning of the Iron Age. Let's say best part of 3000 years ago. And it was built about the same time as the hill fort as well. Now, it's the only one that we know that is really ancient. Most of the other white horses that you see in Wiltshire and up into Yorkshire uh, they were built in the late 18th, early 19th century, uh, very often in the reign of George III, who was identified with, the, with white horses and was a very popular monarch, in spite of losing America. Um, but our horse, uh, the question then is, well, why did they build it, make it, uh, 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 3,000 years ago? Well, the latest theory we've been looking at is the idea that the horse was not positioned to be seen from maximum effect from below, but was positioned so that when the sun rose, it looked like the horse was pulling the sun. Because we know that in the Bronze Age, the sun was an incredibly important religious symbol. Many, many examples of, of, uh, of this. And there's a particularly uh, famous object called the Trondholm Sun Chariot, which shows horses drawing a cart on which there is a huge model sun and the sun is gold on one side and on the other side it's dark so in other words the, the horses are pulling the horse the sun through the sky and then at night pulling it back to start again at dawn and actually the way that the white horse is situated it does that incredibly effectively and it's almost like a little piece of theater if you go there at the right time in the morning you see the sunrise right over the horse and they look like they're flowing across the sky. So that's a theory. And as I say, it is a theory or a hypothesis, if you like. Uh, but I think the interesting thing with the horse is it survived for 3000 years and yet it's quite a fragile thing. Uh, it means that every 20 or 30 years, people had to look after it. And so for 3000 years, local people have looked after that horse. And in all that time, I think its meaning must have changed quite a lot. So that, it, but what thing you can say to it is always important for local people, for whatever reason, and they've looked after it from the Bronze Age right through to now. And there aren't many things you can say that about. There's something fascinating about the longevity of some of these prehistoric monuments and landmarks, and about how, the way they do live on through um, that. Uh, that uh, dating technique, I think, was just used to date some Cornish field boundaries, wasn't it? Down in the, yes, it's down in become the... quite common now. Yeah. It's, a, it's now a standard technique. In yeah. fact, we are considering going back to the White Horse because I was talking to the OSL experts just recently, and uh, we uh, we think that we could get a more precise date now. So we might go back and try again. 
Uh, excellent. Watch this space. Um, so, so, um, so we talked about the uh, the Iron Age, and we dropped that in into the conversation just a bit uh, bit then. Uh, the, the Iron Age uh, again in archaeological nomenclature follows the the Bronze Age, and we've got a question from Nick Booth on Twitter, uh, which is, uh, "How did the Iron Age Britons dispose of their dead?" Ah, uh, yes. Now he's probably asking this question because quite a lot of the textbooks will say that. After the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, where we've got lots of evidence of burial, you get into the Iron Age and it, it, there's a sort of common wisdom that we don't find bodies in the Iron Age. So what on earth are they doing with them? Well, uh, there are various theories, uh, but one possibility is that uh, they were putting bodies into the river. We've, we've certainly found uh, many uh, uh, human remains, for example, at Battersea, in uh, down in London, there's lo loads of uh, human remains in the river there, and they're not from modern gangsters or the Sopranos. These have the, these have been dated to the Iron Age. So it may be that the Thames was regarded rather like the Ganges as a place in which to place the dead for people in that area. However, uh, we also the very first excavation I ever did as a professional archaeologist on the Mendips, we found lots of Iron Age grain storage pits. These are pits dug into the ground where people put their grain to preserve it. And then once the grain had been taken out, these pits were used sometimes to fill with rubbish. But on our site, they'd used them to bury the dead. And actually, there are quite a few of these uh, sites now from the Iron Age where grain storage pits are used to place human remains. Also, just recently near Oxford, um, a colleague of mine called Jill Hay did a huge excavation at a site called Yarnton, and she found a cemetery of, of cremations. And there's absolutely nothing with the cremation, no pots, no finds. You couldn't tell what date they were by looking at them. But the Radio Carbon dates showed they were Iron Age. So that's another possibility. Perhaps people were being cremated, but buried without any grave goods to identify them. And of course, there could have been many of these but have not been radiocarbonated. And then the final thing I'd just say is that, of course, in some places there are very spectacular Iron Age burials, particularly up in East Yorkshire, where there's a thing that's sometimes called the Arras culture, because there there was a, a uh, burial ground of barrows uh, at a place called Arras Farm. Uh, there's another nearby site, which is one of my favourite archaeological names, a site called Wetwang Slack. And Wetwang Slack also had a burial cemetery. And the richest of these barrows have carts or chariots in them with very uh, rich prestige burials. And these belong to a tribe known as the Parisi, which as you might guess from the name, could be a tribe that came from France. So I think well, the answer to the question really is that actually there are more Iron Age burials than we realize, but they seem to be very varied across the country. There's no sort of standard method of burial. Iron Age people seem to have had very varied and different cultures in different parts of the country. Okay, so we've, we've sort of, we've gone on a journey there from uh, from the Mesolithic right through to the Iron Age and, and tackled lots of interesting uh, topics. We've got um, a few more questions to end, which are uh, a bit more general, um, which which are probably harder to answer, but, uh, but let's give you a go. So Krista Dubs on uh, Twitter, no, Krista Dubs, sorry, on Twitter, asks, what do we know about the languages they spoke? Do we know what they sounded like? I think you need a whole bunch of other people for another three quarters of an hour for this one, because... It's, that is a really tough question, and one that there's an enormous amount of interest in, research interest in at the moment. And it, but it, it's a research for people who are, um, who are ling, ling, technical linguists and, and, and linguistic historians, as it were. Um, I can just give you an idea, because we do know that uh, when the Romans arrived, uh, the, the tribes that occupied Britain were speaking languages that are known as Celtic. There were several different like dialects, if you like, around the country from Ireland into Britain, into, into Northern Britain, uh, where the Celtic language varied, uh, but modern Welsh, modern Gaelic, uh, modern Irish are descendants of those languages. Uh, the, and that's what, the, the, when the Romans arrived, that's the language they would have met. Uh, the Celtic languages were Indo-European languages, 
So the question is, is when did Indo-European languages arrive in Britain? Now, a few years ago, people would have said, oh, in the Iron Age, that's when the Celtic people arrived. But actually, more recently, people have begun to speculate that perhaps the Indo-European languages arrived with the first farmers, those guys I was telling you about earlier on, who brought farming from the continent. Did they bring a new language? So we haven't a clue what the Mesolithic people spoke. Then, uh, more recently, there's also been the idea that perhaps uh, the uh, Indo-European languages came in from uh, Central Western Asia via Eastern Europe and came in in the Bronze Age. Now, as I say, there's a huge technical literature on this. Uh, most Western European languages, French, German, English, are Indo-European. But there are a few weird languages around Hungarian, uh, Finnish, Basque, which are very different. Um, are they from older languages? Um, we're not sure. So, of course, we can't hear what these dead people speak. Uh, we can, this is very much a subject for hypothesis. Okay, a couple more. Uh, this, this is one that's asked a lot on Google. Um, do we know what sort of religion they believed in in prehistory? And religion, of course, is a term that's freighted with, with meaning nowadays, so that's it quite is. difficult again, itself. But there, there, there are, there, again, there are specialists who don't like to use the word religion. They like to say belief systems. <laughs> uh, I think it's because we t if we think of religion, we tend to think of something that has a book, the Bible, or a catechism, a set of rules. It's got a hierarchy of priests, bishops, archbishops. Christianity is rather like that. Uh, Islam is rather like that. Um, Judaism to a certain extent as well. So we tend to think of these sort of well-organized religions. In, the, in prehistoric times, it wasn't like that. The religions were much looser, I think. Um, we know a certain amount about the, lay, the Iron Age religions from uh, what the Romans tell us. But I don't think the Romans were necessarily very expert at studying other people's religions. But they obviously thought that uh, Celtic people, for example, had uh, gods that they associated with the sky, uh, gods that they associated with fertility. They had gods that associated with rivers and shrines. We do find quite a few uh, uh, sh uh, Celtic uh, prehistoric shrines where springs emerge, for example. The classic one is the Sos de la Seine where the River Seine made, emerges in Burgundy. There's a fantastic prehistoric and Roman shrine there. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the, a lot of the gods would be associated with features of the landscape or features of the heavens, I think. And then there'd also be gods that were associated with the tribe and with the ancestors. But it would have been a much looser sort of thing, I think, than, uh, than, we, than we're accustomed to. And of course, if you go back further in time, you know, the, the period of Stonehenge and the Henge monuments, there could have been very different religions then. Uh, there's, a, there's a really good book by Ronald Hutton uh, on the pagan, uh, the pagan religions of the British Isles, which I'd recommend, uh, in which he does a very good job of surveying the archaeological and literary evidence for, uh, for, for this. And also Miranda Green has written a whole series of extremely good books on prehistoric and Roman uh, religion anyone's interested in that. Okay, um, just a couple more. And, and I think this is my favorite one. This is a question that was asked a lot from our, from our followers on Instagram, uh, which it, it, there's no way you can be able to answer this, but were people happier in prehistory? <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great question. And it's quite a common one I get as well. People say to me, you're an archeologist. If you could have lived at any time, when would you have lived? And I, I always usually say, I'll live now, thank you very much, because I appreciate modern dentistry. I've dug up some people who had the most terrible problems with their teeth. <laughs> but, but I think people ask that question because there's a lot of, um, if you like, a, a romance of the past. Uh, the idea that perhaps times in the past were better. Now, of course, there's the well-known saying that in the past, life was brutish, nasty, and short. Um, I wouldn't go quite that far, but I do think it's important that we don't fantasize about the past too much or romanticize the past too much. Think that the modern world is somehow, I mean, obviously we have in huge environmental problems. I wouldn't deny that for one minute. And 
what we're doing to the world is needs extremely serious action. But um, but nevertheless, in the past, you've got to remember that first of all, people didn't live so long. They they did die very young by modern standards. Uh, childbirth was dangerous both for women and for children. Lots of children died very young. Uh, if you get into later prehistory, into farming, farming's hard work. It's not a romantic job. It's bloody tough. I've, when we excavate these people's bodies, we find a lot of evidence of uh, arthritis and so on uh, in quite young people. people. Some archaeologists and anthropologists have argued that also past societies were very violent. Certainly they had problems with disease, like just as we're having now with this virus. Uh, we know that there were many incidences of uh, plague and so on in the past. So life in the past could be quite tough. On the other hand, you know, you were living in small communities where probably everybody knew each other. Perhaps people weren't so lonely. Uh, perhaps the, the countryside was still pleasant uh, and, uh, and so on. But uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't be too keen to go and rush back to live in the past. I think it, you might find it a bit tough. Right, last one um, uh, from Logical Laura on Twitter. Great question. Are there any common myths or misconceptions about British prehistory that you would like to dispel? <laughs> well, the one all archaeologists say is, oh, could we please banish the Druids from Stonehenge? Because, you know, we, Stone, uh, Druids were mentioned by Julius Caesar and other Roman writers. And so they were around about 2,000 years ago. Stonehenge started about 5,000 years ago. So there's really no link. And yet in the, in, modern, in the modern British myth, of course, everybody thinks of Druids at Stonehenge. I don't for one minute think that I'll ever get my way. I think that, I think that one is really with us. But what I would say is not so much banishing a myth as actually introducing prehistory properly. What I would really love is if prehistory was introduced into the curriculum of children at schools, so that instead of starting history with the Romans or the Tudors or the Normans, which strictly speaking is the last five minutes of our history, we in, children were taught in a, in a quite a simple but interesting way about how old human beings are, how we evolved, how we developed the different ways of life from hunting and gathering to farming to modern technology and cities and so on so that they get some sense of the big picture of the human journey, as it were. And I think it would be really great if we could see that in the curriculum, instead of the rather fragmented subject which passes as history today. Thank you, David. Thank you for that uh, tour de force through British prehistory. And just as a reminder, and anyone who's watching the video, uh, here's a couple of, of your oh, most you. recent <laughs> books, uh, The Tale Very of the green. Axe. Uh, and The Land of the White Horse, both published by um, Thames and Hudson. And uh, you've got loads of others as well. Tribes of Britain was, a, was another good yeah. one you wrote a while back. Um, and as you say, you're working on this, this new one on, uh, on megaliths, which sounds fascinating uh, when, when you're able to get out and about and do a bit more research on that. So thank you so much for your time. And, uh, and I hope, uh, hope our listeners have enjoyed that.